If you'll please stand with me and take your Bibles, I want you to go to the New Testament, to the book of Jude. That's a big book. If you get to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, you went too far. <clears throat> you passed it. If you get to Second John, you need to go a little further. You'll see Third John. Then you need to take another little step over to Jude. You might mix it, miss it in the midst of all that. I would say turn me to Jude chapter 1, but there is only one chapter. Okay? Um, I, you should be getting a piece of paper, and I've tried my best to put some, some notes on there for you to cover the introduction here to the book of Jude. Um, you can put notes on there, extra notes. I'm going to have extra things. I'm only covering part of it tonight. We'll have, uh, Lord willing, next Sunday night. Um, we'll try to cover some more notes about Jude going into it. We want to lay some foundation work here um, before we start diving into the text itself. And we'll be here for a little while in Jude. A lot of information here in the book of Jude. Jude, I want you to go with me to verse number 1. I'm sorry, verse number 3. Jude, verse 3. The Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The use of the word that characterizes this whole book or a phrase here. And the, and the phrase is, Earnestly contend for the faith. Earnestly contend for the faith. Let's pray. Father, if there's one thing we need tonight, it is to know what we believe and then to contend for it. And not just to contend, but to earnestly contend for it because it's worth contending for. Thank you for letting us hear the faith. Thank you for letting us have faith. I pray you'd help us tonight as we look through some things and what's going on around this in this book and uh, as we get into it that you would open up our eyes to some things here and you would help us. You speak to our hearts, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So it's a little bit different. Um, I'm going to try to make it as interesting as I can, laying out some things here of uh, the books. Um, actually, sometime I want, to, I want to give a survey of the whole Bible. I want to start going from Genesis all the way to the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ and cover all 66 books and give you an overview of them. Um, I don't know when the Lord's going to allow me to start that, uh, but we're going to start here in Jude tonight and start working on this book. And so... So you'll see, and you're gonna, I'm going to follow right along with the, what your paper says there, starting out with the penman here of the book of Jude. Now Jude is derived from, uh, the name Jude is derived from the name uh, Judah. And it's, it's the English form of the name Judas that we find in the Greek uh, there. There are five Judases mentioned in the New Testament. Why don't you go with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 16, the Bible says, And Judas, the brother of James, and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So we're going to first talk about this uh, Judas being an apostle, the one who was the brother of James. Because there's two Judases in this verse. So there's the one, the apostle, who's the brother of James. Now we've also find in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, as we're talking about this Judas that was an apostle. Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, the Bible says, And when they were coming in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zealots, and Judas, the brother of James. And so here we find Judas, the brother of James, also mentioned again. 
as one of the uh, apostles. And so there's one of the Judases, and then also in Luke chapter 6, we said another Judas, and it was Judas Iscariot, and they identified him, who was also the traitor. <laughs> okay, this is not the good Judas. This is the bad Judas. And uh, so we find him, and, uh, and but we don't find uh, Jude... Uh, the name Jude being mentioned as an apostle here in this, in this list of talking about it. Now, there was another Judas, uh, Judas of Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, and beginning in verse 10, it says, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. To him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, he said, Behold, I am here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and, he, and, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias among in, uh, I'm sorry, coming in and putting him, his hands on him, and they might, that they might receive his sight. And so we find here another Judas, the Judas of Damascus, I believe is different than the other two. And then we have another Judas in Acts chapter 15 and verse 22. The Bible says, Then, then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. So we have Judas who was surnamed Barsabbas. Uh, and the previous two uh, did not have a brother named James that they're identified with. Um, so we come down to now the last one, which is Judas, the brother of, of James, but which we would believe was also the pastor at Jerusalem and was also the half-brother of Jesus. Um, we find that in Matthew 13. If you'll go back to Matthew 13 with me. And uh, verse 55, the Bible says, Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and, si and Simon and Judas? So this Judas, the half-brother of Jesus uh, here. And then in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, the Bible says, Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So when it, when it has Judah here, that's referring to Judas in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3. And so Jesus had some half-brothers and sisters, just none of them had God the Father as the Father. But Jesus, <laughs> he was the miracle baby. Uh, they were all miracles, right? Every baby's a miracle. He just happened to be the, uh, the, uh, the miracle baby. And then, so he doesn't claim here when we get into the book of Jude, he doesn't claim to have an earthly relationship to Jesus, although we know that uh, from history and in what the Bible says here that this Jude was, or Judas, which was also Jude, was known, uh, was the half-brother of Jesus. He doesn't claim that, but he does claim a spiritual relationship to Jesus. And I like to tell you that what's mo more important than any blood relationship is being in relationship spiritually. I mean, he could have started the letter off if the Holy Spirit would have let him, right? He could have started the letter off, I am the brother, blood brother of Jesus Christ, half-brother, right? I got, and, I'm, a, I'm you know, I'm, he's my Lord and Savior. He could have started off and thrown off his credentials. Well, he didn't say that. He didn't say that in the book. So it's more important of, of if we know the Lord or not than who we are related to. <laughs> I'm glad I have a relationship with the, with the Son of God. That makes me a joint heir. Joint heir with the king. Amen? So we got something about the, the, the penman, Jude, here. We find that he was the brother of James, and his brother was the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. And then he's the half-brother of Jesus that the Lord's using to write this book. And so we come to a, a date. Talk about a date. It could have been, uh, some people said it from 69 to, uh, 66 to 69 A.D. 
Some people put it from 67 to 68 AD. Some people say 68 to 70 AD. It could be anywhere in between there um, uh, when it was written, but somewhere between 66 and 70. On your paper, I think I have 66, 67 to 68 uh, would have been my best guess at it, looking at different things of historical value. Uh, but after 2 Peter was written is probably um, when this book was written because it appears that Jude quoted 2 Peter under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Well, you know, a lot of New Testament writers did quote Old Testament. Um, they were used, inspired to write that down and to quote the Old Testament. And so it could have been very well that he was used to do that. So when I say that, that it seems that he quoted some from, uh, from 2 Peter, let's just do some comparison real quick. Let's go, if you'll go to 2 Peter and then you'll keep your finger at Jude as well. Let's just make some comparisons. In Jude 6, the Bible says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. If you go over to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says this, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Pretty, pretty close, pretty similar to what's being said there. Um, I think the point's the same. In Jude 11, the Bible says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are the spots in your feast of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. What a description. We come to Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15, and the Bible says, Which have forsaken the right way, and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked by his iniquity, uh, by his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds are they carried with a tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. Sounds pretty similar. Then you come to Jude uh, 17 and 18, and the Bible says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Then you come to 2 Peter 3.3. 3. Now, I think he's referring back to the Apostle Peter because Apostle Peter, what he just said, now Apostle Peter writes here in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffered, scoffers walking after their own lust. So he, he most likely had 2 Peter and he knew something and then the Lord used that as he ins inspired him to write the book of Jude here um, about apostasy. Now Peter, when we look at these two books in comparison, Peter saw false teachers coming in the future. He saw them coming. And he says in chapter 2 verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Shall be. Future tense, he's warning them that they're still coming, there'll be more of them. Who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and brought and bring them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So he saw false teachers coming in the future, and Jude saw them as already there. In verse 4 of Jude, he says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old time. To this uh, ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He said, they're already here. Peter said, they're coming. Jude said, they're already here. They're already among us. And, um, and so maybe, maybe Jude was written after the destruction in Jerusalem at 70 AD. Probably not. But since the apostasy was already in full force at that time, it could have, that could be about the time of it, but most likely it was before 70 A.D. and before the fall of Jerusalem when they was overthrown and destroyed. There, talking about the date, the setting of it here. Um, the addressee. So who is it addressed to? Who is he addressing? Well, specifically the Jewish churches. 
the Jewish churches, the Jewish mindset here. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but I believe it was the Jewish mindset here in Asia Minor. But all churches in general. So, yes, he was speaking specifically to them, but we all, we have an application of what the Bible's talking about to us, and we need to take heed to it as well. So where was it written? We're not really exactly sure, but it could have been written in Jerusalem, maybe when he was uh, uh, living there, maybe he was at the church there that his brother James pastored, and he wrote it. I'm not sure what all the in instances of, but it could have been written in Jerusalem. So what are the occasions for the writing? The occasions. Why was this book even written? And uh, Well, it's dealing with uh, apostates. And so as we're talking about apostasy, an apostate is someone who professes faith in Christ, but they deny the faith. Now, the faith is the body of truth we must accept to receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. The faith. It's different from faith. It's the faith. Apostates are those who turn from the truth, reject the truth, resist the truth. Apostates. Dr. Sexton said this quote, Apostates are empowered by the devil, turning from the revealed truth, yet maintaining an appearance of belief. Those are dangerous people. And a lot of times, you can't tell them. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. These apostates. They know what to say. They'll say everything you want them to say. But they don't believe a bit of it in their heart. They reject that truth in their heart. As the book of Acts, let's think about Acts and Jude here for a second. Uh, as Acts is known as the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, because that's what it is, so Jude is known as the Acts of the Apostates. Same thing, we see the working of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, but we see the working of the apostates here in the book of Jude. They're both transitional books, at the book of Acts and the book of Jude. They're both transitional books. Acts shows us the early days of the church age, and Jude shows us the closing days of the church age. It's all coming to an end because you know what comes after Jude, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, it's all going to be wound up and bound up there in the revelation of Jesus Christ. There was widespread apostasy. There was rejection of the lordship of Christ and gross immorality. And when I say lordship of Christ, I'm not saying that you've got to make them lord or you're not getting saved in the doctrine of lordship of Christ. But I'm saying when, they, when, these, when the apostates were there, they were saying, he doesn't have to have control of your life. No, he wants control of your life. He wants all control of your life. He is the Lord. And, uh, and so there were people. That's why they could go and cause lasciviousness. That means going and committing any sin they wanted to say under the grace and guise of grace. Um, under saying, well, we're under grace. We can do whatever we want to do. That's not being under the Lord's master or lordship of our lives. Jude describes a time in which there are, uh, by large, people have turned from revealed truth and who, uh, who we are to act and respond to at all. Um, sorry, let me read that again. Jude describes a time in which, by large, people have turned from revealed truth and how we're to react and respond to all that. How we're supposed to deal with that when people have turned from truth. We're living in the book of Jude right now. These are dark days, and the light of Jesus Christ is coming on the horizon. I mean, apostates are in the church. If we're not careful, apostates will be in our church. Yep. So we've got to be watched. The occasion for the writing. That's what's going on here. What is the main purpose of the writing? Well, he's writing to Hebrew believers that they must earnestly contend for the faith. He was writing to warn the readers of the apostates who were trying to deceive them. Peter had already prophesied this, and we already read those verses, that there were going to be false teachers coming in and trying to deceive them. He also wrote to exhort them to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. He also said, to, he uh, wrote this for the purpose to challenge all believers, or there would be no common salvation anymore. It would not be widely known how to be saved anymore. The apostates would make sure of that. It is also to arouse the believers to defend the faith and to proclaim the faith. To warn us against seducers and their seduction and to inspire us to love 
the truth. That's what we want to get out of this book. We want it to help us this way. Let me give you just a short, there's an outline here on your paper, but you might want to write to the side a shorter outline than this. So the shorter outline would go like this. In verses 1 through 19, Jude exposes the danger of apostasy. First 19 verses, he's hammering hard on apostasy. And he's exposing the danger of apostasy. And in verse 20 through 25, he exhorts the duty, or exhorts to duty, the believer. What are we supposed to do in the face of apostasy? And this is how we're supposed to be living now that we're in this age of apostasy. So we want to go through the longer outline now. This is what I'm going to be preaching, <laughs> preaching through uh, the book of Jude here. And we're going to close with this, but I, what I want to do is tell you what these scriptures are talking about. We're going to read all the way through Jude, all 25 laborious verses, and, uh, and we're going to draw this out, this outline here tonight and finish here. Okay? So first of all, in verse 1 and 2, we're going to see that we're preserved from apostasy. When I say we're, I mean those who are saved, those who know the Lord. We're preserved from it because we see the authenticity of the penman and also the assurance of, of the believers. Look at verse 1 and 2. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called, mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. We're preserved from apostasy. Aren't you glad we're preserved? Uh, in verse 3 and 4, we're going to find that the, we find the problem of apostasy. And apostasy abolishes the common salvation, and apostasy aggressively contends for the pseudo-faith, the false faith. And there's a lot of things that call themselves the faith that's not the faith. It didn't come from the Bible, it came from the devil. Look at verse 3 and 4, the problem of apostasy. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we stop, we stop there and we move forward past there to past apostates. So in verse 5 through 7, we're going to see some glimpses of past apostates that he's talking about. And he's going to, we're going to see the failure of the, the Israel. We're going to see the fall of angels and the fornication of Sodom and Gomorrah. Look what the Bible says. I will therefore put you in remembrance, that's past, that though you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angel which kept not their first estate, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Past apostates. Then we look at present apostates from verse 8 to 16, and we find out some characteristics of apostates, the condemnation of apostates, and the conduct of apostates. Look at these verses, verse 8 through 16. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body. Let me get on the right spot. Disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about with winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all 
that are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. We just saw something about present apostates. Then we're going to see something about the power over apostasy. We have that power in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the power comes when remembering and building and trusting. And the Bible says here in the last verses, it says, But, beloved, that's us, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory, with exceeding joy, to the only wise God and our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the book of Jude. And we're going to travel through it. We're going to see what that's talking about. But I just give you the outline of it, give you an overview of it, hopefully give you a little taste of it, you want more of it, you'll come back next Sunday night and we'll talk about some more things here on this list, finishing that up and again get right into the book uh, there itself. I'm excited about this little book of Jude and uh, what we're going to learn here. I want to leave you with this. We must earnestly contend for the faith or the faith will not be around for us to contend for. If we don't contend for it, who's going to stand? Who's going to earnestly stand? Somebody's got to stand. A whole bunch of somebody's got to stand. So maybe the Lord will help you tonight and encourage you through this. Pray that the Lord will give you earnestness to contend for the faith. Father, we do thank you for your word tonight. Thank you that we got a glimpse into this chapter. And, um, oh, I wish we could go into more.